It's the kind of house they don't build anymore. A relic of a time when the world wasn't in such a hurry. When there was still time for a little charm and elegance. It has stood empty for a long while. And at the price, it is a bargain. For a growing young family, it is almost too good to be true. What do you think? I love it. James Brolin, Margot Kidder, Rod Steiger, in the Amityville Horror. God's peace in this house. Kathy? Father Delaney, there's something very important. after the Lutz family moved into their dream house. They were running for their lives. What happened to them is an experience in terror you will never forget. And you will believe in the Amityville horror. From the best-selling book that made millions believe in the unbelievable, the Amityville horror. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault Podcast. I'm your host RJ McCready and for this episode we'll be talking about a haunted house, a very famous haunted house and that is the Amateurville Horror. And I thought I'd do this episode because it is October, it's the month of Halloween so I thought I'd do something a little bit spooky. Um, I've just done the Enfield Horror which um, I really enjoyed doing, really had enjoyed looking into that case and um, I thought the two kind of go together really um, but when it comes to the Amateurville horror this one kind of fits a, a certain sort of pedestal in the mystery world so for example when you think about a monster in a lake you think about the Loch Ness monster and when you think about aliens Roswell generally comes to mind as a famous case and then when I think about Haunted House, Amateurville comes to mind. Um, it's it's up there. I think um, if you went into a house and you, someone said, oh, you know, it's haunted, it's a good chance someone's going to come out and say, oh, it's like the Amateurville horror. And even the name sounds bloody spooky as well, doesn't it? You know, Amateurville horror, something about it. Um, so if you're, I'm talking as if you guys may know what, what this case is so if you if you are aware of it if you're not let's just go for a quick synopsis um so it's got back in the 70s 1975 you had uh, the lutz family and they bought a house in new york um, a colonial dutch built house nice property but you know even when i talk about the property even the even the house looks scary you know that front of the house with the quarter cut windows looks like it's got a couple of eyes on it anyway they claimed that the house was haunted they could only stay there for 28 days and then they fled the house and then from there onwards it captured some some media attention and uh, there was a book written about it it's uh, created many movies a really good film the Amateurville horror which came out in the 70s Sequel's not so good. I think they get even worse as they go along. Uh, there's a there was a remake 
Um, I think in the in the mid two thousands it came out. I'm not so sure whether that did well or not. Um, but anyway, it's it's it sparked a little bit of controversy as well to whether this this case is true or not. And what I didn't know, uh, which is often the case when I look into these um, mysteries, is you know, I tend to pull stuff out, which I mean, oh, okay, I didn't know about that. Uh, there's actually a lawsuit against the Amazonville horror, uh, which happened in the 70s. And I'll get into that later on. It kind of just beefs up whether you believe in this or not. Um, so let's turn back the clock. Let's go back to 1974 and talk about um, the family that lived there previously in this uh, uh, Dutch colonial house. And let's give you the address. It's 112... Ocean Avenue, uh, situated in uh, Long Island, New York. It's on the South Shore. And on November 13th, you had a guy called Ronald the Pharaoh Jr. And now this is true. This is this is actually a crime case at the Amateurville um, house. Uh, he killed his family, killed six members of his family um, with a rifle. And he actually claimed that he had voices in his head that instructed him to do it, which is a bit strange. But it might have something to do with him taking drugs and being on LSD. He was an avid user of that. Um, he was convicted of second degree murder in November 1975. And he was banged up um, up until he died in custody in March uh, 2021. He, he basically got six sentences of 25 years. But in today's episode, because this is like a that's a crime thing, so I'm going to look into the sort of more the sort of paranormal thing. But it is definitely a building block to say is there you know is there something wrong with this house for the Lutz family? And I would say, with six people being di- dying in a house with those circumstances, well, they haven't just passed away. It's not like the house has burnt down. Unfortunately, the family's died of something. This is a guy who's gone around and killed killed his family with a gun that's that's damn horrific um so i would say that you're going to have some sort of bad energy in the house you know whether you believe in the spiritual world or not i think uh, the fact that people have died in a house in this in this circumstance i think there's going to be some bad energy so that would be the first um thing that i'd be looking at but in this case with the foe he said that he had voices in his head that instructed him to do it. So it's almost like an insinuation of some sort of demonic possession that some people talk about. So then you talk, you turn back the, the time or the clock before that because it's like a colonial house. And I've mentioned this before. Um, I think I've mentioned this before with like, um, like Indian burial grounds. And they say that the site that this house is built on is actually built on Chinook Indian um burial ground it's not just any old burial ground either it's where the um, native american indians took their mentally ill and they basically left them at this location to die which again you know when you think about it, that's going to sort of create some bad energy as well so if that is true you've got that on top of this this crime case so the, the foundations here are quite Negative, I think. A negative would be a word to use. Like a negative type of energy. And I suppose the way you've got to look at this is whether that's true or not. You know, whether, whether there is an Indian burial ground or not of people just saying this because it's, you know, I'm Sam Tavil house has come out let's chuck that one in there. Because again, you know, all the time you've got a big story, people start speculating. But the way I look at it is if, if you believe in the paranormal or not, I think you put this out to, you know, people out there if you went to go and have a look at house today and the state agent said oh here's the house it's beautiful it's by a river da de da de da um but it's built on built on an old graveyard <laughs> i'll be i think nine times out of ten a lot of people will be having second thoughts about that you know regardless because i just think i don't I wouldn't want to live on a graveyard so um that's one to think about um, and then, of course, on top of that, you then go t- t- into the, the said house with the estate agent. The estate agent comes out and says, oh, uh, here's a house. da de da de da but, um, you know, family got killed, you know, by, by their son, you know, shot shot dead. 
Mm, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. You know, I'm just saying, whether you believe in the sort of paranormal or not, I think nine times out of ten there'll be a lot of people going, oh, I think we'll go and have a look at the next house, please. So it's just something to bear in mind. So moving on to December 1975, it's only a few months after the uh, tragic event. You know, George and Kathy Lutz arrive with their three children and they buy the house at a reduced price of $80,000. And in this location, this uh, sought after location in New York, there's a uh, very low price. And um, apparently they knew about uh, what happened in the house um, and it w wasn't an issue. Uh, for them, they were happy to move in, so they did. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, 28 days later, the family fled fled the house, claiming to be terrorised by a paranormal phenomena. So let's talk about some of the events that happened in the house. Um, so George would wake up uh, at 3.15am um, every morning, and that was the, the supposed time, or was the time of the killings. Uh, they had strange odours in the house. They claimed that there was green slime oozing from the walls and the keyholes. And there were like cold spots in the house. And even though it was winter time, they claimed that it was colder than it was supposed to be. There was like a real sort of chill that you get when you go into a property, which I've actually experienced. Um, and now this is the this is the best one. And I think this is the one that really creeped me out. Um is a pig-like creature staring in from the window with red eyes, uh, which is portrayed really well in the film when I remember watching the movie. Um, there is something about um, a window with something looking in with, with red eyes, which kind of sort of hits the high bar when it comes to freaking you out in these stories. So, yeah, so um, these are some of the events that happened in the house that they claimed. And there's also... Um, and they also claimed that the children levitated from their beds as well. This was a reoccurring thing. Um, and I think all these things were, were reoccurring each each night. Um, something spooky was going on in the house. And I think, like I say, the, the pig looking through the window with the red eyes would have to do it for me as well. Um, so as a, as a way of dealing with this, the family hired a priest to come and bless the house. Um, this is also portrayed in, in, the, in the book and the film uh, where the priest comes over and he tries to bless the house and then he claims that he hears a voice saying, Get out! And before the priest left the house, he said to the family, Don't sleep in. There's a particular room that you shouldn't, shouldn't sleep in. But I've blessed it and hopefully that will do. But um, there is some speculation whether the priest actually attended the house or actually did it over the phone. On a, on a telephone call so there are it's a very sketchy case but the more i've looked into Andersville, the more it's kind of like it's very sketchy detail um but i think it's as i as i move on now i'm going to talk about you know the the detail of how to whether this case is true or whether you can disprove it um i'm now going to move on to after the family left the house and then it move on to the actual novel and the book which became very popular and I think it's already ramped up the, the, the case so um, let's move on to that so obviously it, um, this, hit, this hit the media it became very popular um, people were skeptic about it and some people also thought that they'd be able to make a buck out of this as well and this is what I didn't know so uh, this is quite an interesting story if you didn't know about it is a guy called William Webber and he was actually the attorney of Defo who was the defendant who was accused of or who was sentenced to killing his family previously as I mentioned which is you know interesting you've got the attorney turning up with his family and he said that um, I'd, I'd like to write a book. I'd like to get someone to write a book, and I think we can make some money about money out of this. You know, it's not beat around the bush. He's turned up to try and make some money out of this, and um, he set up a contract with the Lutz family, and he said that um, I will give you a certain percentage, and basically he's saying that I will take the higher percentage of the money that is made out of the book, and he hired a writer called Paul Hoffman to publish it. Um, the Lutz family decided to go with um, Jay Anson instead, and that's the person who eventually published the book. 
um, because he gave them more of a favourable contract of 50-50, which obviously you're going to go for. Um, but then the issue is that uh, Paul Hoffman sold two articles to the New York Sunday Times. This caused an issue with the Lutz family. They ended up filing a lawsuit, uh, which sort of amounted to something ridiculous like $4.5 million uh, for uh, like an invasion of privacy, which then went on to a trial in uh, September 1979. But then the uh, judge who was conducting the trial basically criticised Weber's actions saying that, you know, you're an attorney and you're trying to make money out of this case. So basically threw the whole thing out of court and the case was conveniently settled outside of court. Now this actually happened and I found this story more interesting than the actual paranormal case. I don't mean it like that. What I'm saying is is that it, it kind of veers it down the line of you know, were the Lutz family trying to make some money out of this, or did something paranormal go on in the house? It just happened that uh, the the attorneys turned up and said, "Here, you can make some money out of this." But some skeptics say, and this is important, that the Lutz family set all this up from the start. They were they were in debt. They didn't didn't have any money. Uh, they bought this house on the cheap and this whole thing has been conducted as a hoax and they thought let's uh, let's buy the house you've got the crime that's gone on before so people have died in this house and we can sort of say that you know um, there's a there's a demon in the house and which I guess if you think about it, if you look at it like this you know the public would have known about this story with this guy killing his family so as I said, you can have that sort of negative energy in the house. Public are on board with that. And then you've got a family that moves in afterwards. Running out of the house, shaking their hands up in the air and saying, Oh my God, this place has been possessed. You know, it's got demons in it. It's a good chance that the public are probably going to sort of buy into that. But obviously, as it happens, there's some skeptics out there which probably looked at the family and thought, Oh no, this is, this is a hoax. What's interested me today about looking at this case is, you know, when you look at the facts, and I've had a look at, you know, the the lawsuit here, and the fact that the the family were in debt, it, it does make you think: is, is this whole thing made up? But on the other hand, and I say this all the time, I'm always sort of fifty fifty on the fence here. Could it have just been, you know, the fact that this house? is possessed by some demonic demon that family did move in and all these things did happen and they were kind of like a sort of I don't know what the word is you know whether you think Webber was a bit of a dodgy bloke the dodgy attorneys kind of approached the family and sort of got, rubbed his hands together and gone I'm going to make a buck out of this you know could it just be that the family have just gone actually yeah okay we'll make some money because um, what else have we got to lose or is it the fact that the Lutz family, or the parents, should I say, not the children, have been on board with this from the start, you know, with Webb and he said, you know, you move in there, be, be, be the family that's saying that they've been haunted, let's, let's get it in the press, and uh, let's, let's see where we go from there. And I think what's happened here, right, is it's probably a case, when you look at the, uh, the court case, is that, the Lutz is probably annoyed with Weber that Weber wanted to take a more of a bigger percentage of the cut from the proceeds of the book and he, he was going to ditch him with like 10% and Lutz had basically gone, no, no, you, you can have that. So they've basically fallen out with each other and that's where this case has gone wrong, which is nine times out of case with, with greed and all that sort of stuff. I won't get into that today, but you know where I'm going with that. Um, so things have fell flat on their feet. But like I say, it's... Um, I bring all this to the table today, and it can take you down different avenues. What's what's for certain is there was a crime that happened. That's that's actual fact. Um, Lutz moved in, spent a bit of time there, ran out. You've got the story, um, and then of course um, you've got the book that has been published at this time in the seventies. Um, people have bought it. People are intrigued, and there is that there is that certain bit of 
um, interest from the public to say, oh, it's a haunted house. This is a great story. And it is. When you think about it, putting everything else aside, um, because I've seen I've seen the film. It's a good movie. Um, it's you know it's quite it's quite a terrifying film when you think about it. Um, putting everything else aside, it is a good story, which makes a really good film. And whether this is a hoax or it isn't a hoax, the Amateurville horror, the same as that's why I said you know with like you know the Loch Ness monster and Roswell. When you look, well, I've looked at those two cases and I've come away and I've gone, you know what, you can go down the line of, yeah, that's a that's a hoax. You can drain out the Loch Ness and there's no monster in it, but people are still going to believe there's a monster. Same as Roswell. The US Air Force can come out tomorrow and say, guys, there's all the files, there's all the documents. It was just a, you know, a weather balloon. That's a fact. But then people are still going to come away and go, yeah, thanks guys, but we're still going to believe it's aliens. And I think that's the same case with Amsterville. Um, I think, you know, you can say it's a hoax all day long. You're right, you can probably prove it is and all that. But when you look at that house, it looks spooky. <laughs> I probably wouldn't want to spend the night in there regardless. And um, I think people are just going to say, yeah, okay, it is. But it's it still feels like a house that's, you know, possibly got a demonic demon in there that's going to try and possess you. I'm going to take that chance. So um, it's kind of, what I'm saying is it's basically sort of, Printed itself into the uh, in, into the haunted house world, um, but yeah, these these are interesting things when you look at it. Um, like I say, you, you you kind of look at the facts and you kind of make your own mind up. The other thing I need to mention here as well, uh, which is interesting, is it also um, captured the attention of Ed and Lorraine Warren back in the time. I think they turned up in 1975 with a film crew. And they spent some time in the house and they did something like an infrared uh, photography. And they only spent one night there. And they claimed that they captured a picture of a child standing at the bottom of the stairs looking round with um, some demonic eyes. And um, this picture's on, on Google. Take a look at it. Um, don't look at it in the dark on your own because it is quite spooky regardless. Uh, there's also, this may be laughing again. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a guy called Dr. Stephen Kaplan that turned up and he was a self-styled vampirologist you know, someone who investigates vampires he's also a ghost hunter um, he was actually uh, employed by the Lutz family before they fled the house but um, he, he had a falling out with the family because he said, look, I will um, investigate it. But the other thing I do is I also investigate it to prove whether this is a fraud case. But they kicked him out of the house. So that kind of bolsters up the, the fact that this could be a hoax because they've got a paranormal investigator dude turning up, which probably looked good to, the, you know, to their story. But they kicked him out saying, no, no, this guy's he's, he's not doing what we want him to do. He's, he's, you know, he's going to potentially expose us, so that, that's interesting. Um, so up until today, um, there's still debate over the accuracy of, of this case. But as I've mentioned, you know, there's, there's movies, there's books, um, there's documentaries. Um, there's still people turning up, like paranormal investigators, that want to have a look at the house. Um, the house is still there, hasn't been pulled down or anything like that the windows have been taken out the front um which kind of probably does the house a favor because it did look spooky with those windows uh, in 1977 the house was bought by um a family and they lived there for 10 years and they said that they had no issues um this, the only issues they had were people coming over um because of the book and movie which is understandable so um, I think it's always going to be something that is going to be a tourist attraction, I guess, you know. If you go to New York or New York, that part of the um, Long Beach, you're probably going to want to go and have a look at it. So, 
Oh, and they've changed the address from 1112 Ocean Avenue to 108. Can't see what that, how that's going to make the difference, but there you go. I suppose that's just for a, um, a peace of mind. So that is it, uh, people. Um, that is the Amateurville Horror. There are lots of different avenues you can have a look at. Uh, like I say, if um, regular listeners, you, you know, this is kind of like a, a little bit of a... Uh, a, a bite-sized review so you can go away today and if you didn't know about that the Amateurville horror um, hopefully you'll go away and you know with a little bit more um, information on it like I said it's you know apart from the paranormal case the actual lawsuit case is quite interesting um, if you want to go down the path of whether this case is a hoax several different paths you can go down or I'd say you know to 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 end the show today it is a good, is a good ghost story, regardless. And um, Amateurville is always going to be, as I said, you know, if someone's talking about a haunted house, Amateurville is going to come up. And um, and I think that's the other thing to mention as well before I close the show. It's uh, it is, can be that case, or if, if someone tells you it's it's haunted, there's a good chance that your mind can play tricks on you. Just for example, so if you went to a um, an old house, say like going back to like the 16th, 17th century and someone said, oh, that house is haunted. And usually in that case, you know, houses going back to that time, like crooked old houses, you know, do look haunted. You know, that's the, <laughs> that's the usual thing that you would see in a book or something like that. And um, I think nine times out of ten, you'll go in there and you can almost, as humans, we can convince ourselves that that, that would be the case. So you have that as well. So a little bit of food for thought, so I'd um, thought I'd end it on that. Uh, so there you go, guys. Hope you enjoyed that. Let's talk about what I'm going to be doing next. So it is October. Uh, it's the month of Halloween. If I've got time, I'm going to see if I can try and do something um, a little bit fun. I thought about the um, case of the headless horn- horseman, um, and right now, before even looking into that case, I'm going to find. I'm going to see if there is any truth, or is it just a, a made-up story? But um, I think in the sort of ghost world, there is that thing that you know, you know, the headless horn- horseman. You know, let's uh, have a look at that case just for a little bit of fun. I, I think it is just a fictional story, but I will see if there is any truth to it. So um, I'm going to do that episode regardless. So look out for that. It's going to be the next one coming up. Um, let's do some admin for the show before I close it uh, I am a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network so go and check out my other show which is Bite Size Cinema I've been busy with that I've had some guests on um, I managed to get a film director on board for an interview which was great Christopher St. Booth absolutely fantastic bloke um, and I've also had some guest spots with um, fellow podcasters for American Werewolf in London Shining and um, Night of the Living Dead so go and check out those episodes on my other show uh, you can find the Mystery Vault podcast on iTunes Spotify YouTube several other players if you put in by, um, the Mystery Vault podcast onto Google I've got a Facebook page where I'm most active and that's where you can uh, contact me if there's some cases that you want me to take a look at let me know Um so yeah that's it guys Uh, as always keep it spooky keep it safe and I'll see you soon enjoyed this show then make sure you check out the other great shows on the legion podcast network like cinema psyops cinema beef devour the podcast duncan and Bo come correct exploding heads horror movie podcast friday the 13th get slayed the hell mean power hour hello this is the doom show hero hero go show kill the cast underwater kaiju from outer space jerry hates action legion after dark metal health obsessive cinema discourse Pick Six Movies, the podcast by The Cemetery, the podcast on Haunted Hill, the Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, 
Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Witch vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.